We're speaking right now with Bob Moore. Bob has been a longtime professional broadcaster. He was uh, on the air as a teenager. He spent several years on different radio stations working. He also ended up in the engineering side of the business, which took him literally all over the country to some of the biggest markets in America working for some very large radio stations. But he had a, a certainly an impact on West Michigan. Uh, and that's what we want to talk about today. So Bob, uh, as I said, these interviews are very casual. Um, I'm a casual kind of guy. You're a casual guy. Uh, to, let's talk about your career. I mean, you have the unique um, history of having worked at WSHN in Fremont because you were from Fremont. No, oh, that's true. That's where I grew up. Uh, however, what you may not know is that uh, the original uh, radio station in Fremont was WBFC. And WBFC stood for World's Baby Food Capital. Oh, I did not know that. And uh, it started out as a 100 watt station, but I know it shut down in 58, I believe, and uh, it was on 1490, and that frequency moved to Whitehall and uh, became WLRC, and uh, then it was 1000 watts day, 250 night. Okay. And, uh, and that would be WLRC AM yes, radio. Yeah, yeah, the AM. And uh, so then WSHN came on in 1960. Was it always owned by Stu Nordyke? Uh, yes, Stuart and Helen Nordyke, that's the call letters. Oh, okay. I read uh, commercials for the uh, general manager, Bruce Van Houten, who was blind. Okay. And uh, so he did his record shows in the afternoon, and I did his commercials and read the news headlines. and. And uh, that was pretty much it. Was uh, uh, Do you recall what kind of music he played? Well, he had a, a Top 40 show for an hour. Okay. What do you call that thing? A Top 40 club or something, or Top 20 club? <laughs> and uh, For one hour? Yes, for one hour. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Sorry. Even I'm though the right. records are short, you can only play so many. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and then WSHN was a daytimer, and so in the wintertime it was off the air at 5.15 in the evening. Wow. Uh, well, I worked there until uh, sometime in 66. Okay. And I met Don Anderson at a record hop there at the high school, and I talked to him. And uh, Don Anderson of WTRU. Yes, and they were looking for uh, a part-timer, and I told him I was interested and uh, so I went down there for an interview. Now is that the same job that Tim Achterhoff yep, was trying we to were, get hired? Yep, we were going after the same spot. <laughs> is that when you and he met? Uh, yes. Okay. In fact, he was still doing his class break show on Saturdays. For Muskegon High School? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, when I was working there part-time so that's kind of how we met. Okay. And uh, so you beat Tim Actorhoff out of a job. Well, yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> so, so anyway, I worked. Uh, I worked there, and uh, I wanted to work full time for them, of course. But I ended up working for uh, WLRC full time for I don't know less than a year. Okay. And uh, finally, apparently, I got enough experience, and I ended up replacing uh, Jeff Ladd middays on uh, True. Oh. So, and uh, that would have been 68, you said? 67. 67? Yeah. Okay. 68. And uh, then my last uh, on-air job in Muskegon prior to the service was at uh, uh, Channel 54 Television out of the Occidental Hotel. I did uh, camera work. Did uh, a set set up, did the weather outside, and uh, I think that was probably the extent of my duties there, but uh, that was an interesting experience, and I probably had more fun there than 
anywhere else in, uh, in my broadcast career. You know, I had all this broadcast experience at, uh, at this point. Went into the service during the interview that they give you when uh, you get your physical and uh, they're getting ready to draft you into the service. I brought my uh, third class FCC license and uh, I think I brought a brief resume of all the experience I had. And what that did was uh, gave me a 71R20 MOS, which was broadcast specialist. Oh. So I went through basic training, and then I was the last one to get assigned out of my group, and ended up going to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And there, uh, we did all kinds of uh, programming, but we had a uh, program called Fort Dix Report, which we... Uh, got to air on uh, one of the local uh, New Jersey radio stations. I interviewed uh, soldiers for the Army Hometown News Center in Oklahoma City. Okay. And uh, once a month I'd go to Saigon, edit my tapes, and then send them off to the uh, Hometown News Center, and then they would distribute them to the various radio stations around the country, and they would play them uh, you know, for the families of their local sons who were serving in service. You were there a year, approximately? I was in Vietnam, I think, about six months. Six I was months. Uh, okay. smart enough to take a uh, letter with me from uh, Grand Rapids Junior College so I could get a 90-day drop to go to school. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, love I, uh, <laughs> I was uh, spec four at that time, and I had passed all the boards to become a spec five but once I handed in the papers that was the end of my spec five they said uh, well we'll give this rank to someone more deserving than you since you're leaving us so I said well I'd like to stay but uh, yeah, I'd like I want to go home yeah so uh, <laughs> so I got out of the service I think it was like on the 29th or 30th of December of 1969 okay and, uh, and then ended up in uh, school at uh, Grand Rapids Junior College. Uh, and uh, then after that, I went to uh, uh, Rhett's uh, Television Electronics School, which happened to be in Grand Rapids, did that at night. I worked for Tim at MUS for about eight or nine months on the air there at MUS and uh, in 69 no in 70 in 70 okay yeah 1970 I and didn't then, I was uh, not aware of that towards oh. the end of the year is when I went over to WZZM and ended up working mornings there okay and uh, and you were there like what three years yeah I thought uh, that's what Bob Stickrow told yeah, me yeah I left uh, ZZM I think in 1973 okay and that was a pretty big year for me because that was the year when I finally buckled down and got my uh, uh, first class FCC license. So in 1973, uh, I ended up working for Tim again at MUS. And of course it wasn't a full-time slot, so I had to fill in time with, uh, oh, I worked uh, as a technician at Dell TV in Muskegon. I worked uh, uh, for Crouch Communications. So, and then I worked for audio distributors in Grand Rapids uh, for at least a year. And in late 75, I ended up uh, working for uh, Gates Radio Harris Corporation in Quincy, Illinois. But uh, oh, okay. uh, the experiences that I probably got at MUS probably formed the basis for my uh, engineering uh, expertise. Uh, the neat thing about uh, broadcasting is they have a, uh, a period of time called the experimental period from midnight till six in the morning and whether you're a full-time station, daytime station, or, uh, or an FM, because MUS uh, FM only worked uh, till midnight and then signed off Yeah, mm -hmm. back in those days and the AM signed off at sunset so 
Yeah. That was a day timer. Right. So anyway, I uh, spent an awful lot of time at the station during those overnight hours experimenting and working on uh, both transmitters. Probably the thing I'm most proud of that I did at MUS was uh, uh, back when we were still playing records, uh, one of the problems is that if you've got a uh, record that's going to go all the way to the top of your survey, uh, it's going to have an awful lot of cue birds in it. Oh, yeah. And so what I did is I uh, put in a uh, time delay relay system so that when you started the turntable, the audio was cut off for about half a second. And so if you remember back in those days, you had to turn the turntable back a certain distance for 45s and a certain distance for 33. You know, a quarter a turn or half a turn, depending on whatever speed you're on. Right. And uh, you do that enough and it starts to wear a, uh, a noise groove in the record. Oh, there you go. And so to eliminate that, this time delay uh, uh, performed that quite quite well. At MUS, uh, besides the uh, FM transmitter that we installed, we also uh, replaced the BC1T with an MW1, which was an all-solid state transmitter. Uh, MUS ended up buying the uh, transmitter from WZZM that they used uh, on Ann Street and uh, because when they moved to the uh, uh, new building in uh, Walker we got a new transmitter at that point so they had no need for this thing and I'm sure Tim got it at the right price <laughs> and the only thing we had to do is we had to move it from uh, 95.7 to uh, whatever KQDS's frequency was in uh, in Duluth, which was 94.9 now. Yeah, the old uh, KOFM, I think, is what it was. Yeah, KEOH, yep. So uh, that went fairly well, except uh, had a little problem uh, moving the frequency of the transmitter. And I had ended up calling Collins, and I said, I've got an unusual situation here where I can't get this thing to tune up right at the new frequency. Mm hmm and uh, it should have been a piece of cake, but uh, everything worked except the final upward stage, it just wouldn't tune up. So uh, one night while I was up there, I got pretty frustrated, and so I took apart the tube socket, and it was loaded with dust and dirt that uh, probably was in it since the uh, transmitter went on the air, wow. whatever that was. Yeah. And uh, that's what was causing all the tuning problems. So once I cleaned all that stuff out of there, then it tuned right up, and then we were we were on the air from that site. Proving that dust is a great resistor. Yeah, well, it was uh, <laughs> it was certainly a deterrent. So. Yeah. So Bob, you were at Harris for in Quincy, Illinois, till you said it was 1978. around 1978. Then, then where do you go from the, there? Uh, what, what happens next? Well, it was the allure of uh, being associated with a broadcast station again, and there was a uh, an opening in Buffalo, and uh, WKBW was the big rock and roller, and uh, okay. it was on uh, 1520. The opening was for assistant chief, okay. and so, I took that and uh, uh, ended up working for Peter Burke. He designed uh, a real control system that's widely used by uh, radio stations around the country to control their transmitters. Wow. Uh, the station had committed to a uh, remote control system called Telesis, which was supposed to be a computer-based system that would uh, uh, control the transmitters. If one went off, it would put another one on the air automatically. And uh, sure. Well, the guy who developed that system never came through with what he had promised, and so uh, uh, Peter and I uh, ended up designing this uh, uh, remote control system using some pretty uh, early computer hardware. 
No kidding. And uh, Peter, and we're wrote, talking late seventies here. Uh, yeah, and wow. Peter, Peter wrote the uh, uh, the basic program code for it, and I did all the interfacing out at the uh, transmitter site. Nice. And uh, uh, that was uh, quite a day when uh, we fired up that computer and uh, controlled. Controlled the transmitter. It took the readings automatically. Wow! Wow! And uh, and also would put the uh, backup transmitter on the air if the main failed automatically. Okay. So wow, uh, that's really it amazing was, uh, piece of technology. It was uh, yeah, it was way ahead of its time. And uh, so uh, from there, uh, Peter wasn't leaving, so. I couldn't get the chief's job there. Yeah. So uh, Tim had this uh, opening there at uh, WJML in Petoskey. So I Tim went up Acker there and, uh, yep. and worked for Tim uh, a year there at WJML. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a two tower directional AM at 10 kilowatts. And we had a 50 kilowatt FM up there on Boyd mm -hmm. Islands. Mm -hmm. And the uh, station was extremely successful while I was there. Yeah, it made a lot of money. It made a lot of money. Yeah. So, uh, so you did JML for a year. For a year, and then I got Did, did you work by, with Bob and Tom? Uh, uh, yes. They you were, worked with the Bob and Tom? They were, yeah. They were in uh, the Petoskey market at the time. What comes after JML? Uh, from JML, I got a call from Cap Cities who was the owner of uh, WKBW in Buffalo. Okay. And they said, we have a uh, chief engineer's opening in Fort Worth, Texas, and we'd like you to go down there and interview with the uh, general manager and uh, see if that's a good fit for was you. Was that at WBAP? Yes. And the next step was uh, Pacific Recorders. In fact, at WBAP, it was, uh, I got in the middle of another uh, station rebuild. And uh, we uh, relocated the studios, which were in the uh, Channel 5 building, which was, you know, half a mile away, mm -hmm. uh, into our own building. And uh, so the consoles that were ordered were from Pacific Recorders. So that was my first introduction to the product. Okay. And... Uh, and then I ended up working for them as their customer service manager. I worked for them until 1991 and then went to uh, KTNQ and uh, KLVE in Los Angeles. Okay. And uh, those were both Spanish stations, uh, but they were owned by uh, Cecil Heftel and his son. And uh, so uh, Spanish language would have been helpful, but in my area of expertise, it wasn't really necessary. I got a call from Westinghouse uh, broadcasting in uh, New York, and they said, uh, we have a uh, transmitter rebuilding project, and we would like you to be the uh, program manager of the, of the project. It'll probably take, oh, a year and a half or so. And what radio station was that? Uh, WINS. WINS in New so, York. Okay. That uh, was another big radio station. Yes, it was. Uh, let's see, their slogan was, uh, you give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. 1010 WINS was a big blowtorch uh, to Manhattan, okay. and that's what it served. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, Millions the of problem, people. Uh, oh, yeah, the problem with the station and the reason they had to rebuild the transmitter site is that uh, the FCC finally, after about 20 years of uh, uh, special temporary authority, said, look, either you get this directional antenna pattern straightened out, or we're going to cut your power. Yes. And you make the decision. And so... Uh, that made the decision right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of scrambling. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so this uh, project got underway in a swamp uh, there in New Jersey, in uh, Lyndhurst. Wow. 
The uh, original towers were, I think, about 220 feet tall. Four towers in line, aimed at uh, Manhattan. And they were directional? And uh, Oh, yeah. Because there were four of them. Yeah, right? directional all the time. Yeah. And uh, the new towers were 400 and, uh, I think, 80 feet. And they were kind of in a parallelogram. And the system was designed to properly uh, protect uh, Charlotte in, I think, South Carolina. Okay. And the other protection requirement was in Toronto. Oh, and okay. that was where the big problem was, was getting the null deep enough so they were protected properly. And uh, these, this new tower pattern was supposed to do that. Uh, the issue was the original designer of the array never could make it work. Uh, at one time, uh, 1010 Winds was the number one billing station in the nation. Wow. That's how much money the thing made. It was, well, you're reaching it was a monster. So anyway, we finished up the 1010 Winds project, and uh, we need a uh, chief engineer for WCBS AM and FM in uh, New York, and uh, we would like you to fill that position. And I said, well... Uh, I've really had enough of New York, but I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll give you two years, and at uh, at the end of two years, and I'm out of here, and I'm going back to Michigan. Yeah, I left uh, I think in May of uh, 2000, and came came here to uh, Fremont. So I had this job at uh, BlackRock at uh, CBS. WCBS, and. Wow. Uh, uh, AM transmitters for WCBS and for WNBC, which later became the fan, which yeah. was Dimes. an all-sports uh, station. Two stations shared a tower on their own island uh, just uh, north east of Manhattan called High Island. And uh, uh, NBC had their building, CBS had theirs. And then uh, they merged together at the base of the tower, and then each each fed the uh, tower with their 50 kilowatt signals. So okay. All right. that was a uh, pretty hot area for RF. I worked through. I remember the Y2K issue? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a, <laughs> we had a remote studio set up out there at the transmitter site at High Island with the uh, with uh, some news talent out there in case. Things crashed in uh, New York at BlackRock, <laughs> and uh, they didn't. We were well prepared, and everything went flawlessly. Was so, Y2K a, was that a legitimate concern? Yes. At the time, did you believe it? Well, could be? it was because uh, uh, all of the older computers, the calendars stopped uh, before uh, the year 2000, okay. and so uh, if they didn't get New software loaded or some hardware modifications, then uh, so it they, wasn't they a myth. Quit. It was it, real. It was real. Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, I know CBS spent an awful lot of money on that problem. The <laughs> FM station was uh, uh, up into the master antenna system at uh, uh, Empire State, and uh, WCBS. FM was there, and WCBS Television oh. had a backup facility there. Okay. And uh, they were the only one left uh, in the television air arena at, uh, at Empire, because everybody went to the World Trade Center. Oh, so boy. when the World Trade Center collapsed, wow. WCBS was the only, only TV station that could operate. It was the best location for television in uh, Manhattan. But in the end, CBS was the and, only one uh, on the... Wow. CBS won in the end there, so... Wow. Uh, Can you imagine what the ratings must have been at well, CBS Well, I would imagine they were probably pretty good, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the other TV station had to scramble for space yeah. wherever they could find it. Yeah. And uh, it oh, was man. pretty limited. Wow. But... Uh, I think most of them got back on the air. The problem with working in Manhattan, and especially at a station like WCBS, is there's an awful lot of 
weight on your shoulders and you're responsible for uh, radio stations operating flawlessly for millions of listeners that uh, uh, they cater to every day. And I knew if I would have stayed there, you know, uh, a longer length of time, I would have had some health issues. No kidding. Okay. And uh, so I, I knew I had to leave. And uh, so uh, I had uh, been thinking about uh, moving back here to Fremont for quite some time and uh, finally figured out a way to do it. And uh, that was to uh, build a uh, build a business refurbing uh, Pacific Recorders analog consoles. I knew it was uh, I was the the one best qualified for it. Okay. Because uh, I had worked at uh, Pacific Recorders when all these uh, analog products were introduced. Yeah. So you knew and how they were so made. So I knew them happened. inside and out, and I was yeah. customer service manager there for. For six years, so I was the logical choice. Just looking back, yes. I mean, you've had an amazing career as an engineer. Um, coming back home was like you were ready to do this. You were ready to come back to where you grew up. Yep. Yeah. Um, at this point, you're 50 years old. Yep. Uh, looking back, you're you're from Fremont. Is it safe to assume? You are the most successful broadcaster this town ever, uh, had, you know, that came from Fremont, Michigan. Well, yeah, I guess probably. I yeah. mean, can you think of anybody else who ever had think... a career comparable to yours? No, no, not that I know of. Yeah, so that's kind of unique when you think about it. Yeah, that's true. Because had, Gerber, uh... baby food capital of the world, lots of money, smart people here yep. in Fremont. Uh, so impressive. So now... Uh, one of the questions we ask everybody yes. is, um, and it, this is one of my favorite ones, is the past favorite people you've worked with. Well, I thought probably the uh, uh, the characters that hung out at WMUS were probably uh, uh, some of the best. Uh, but I have fond memories at WTRU. Yeah. And uh, uh, Don Anderson was... Uh, was kind of a mentor over there for me mm -hmm. while I was there. And uh, I must mention uh, Jack Majeski, who was uh, uh, my engineering mentor and uh, taught me an awful lot while I was uh, at uh, MUS. And uh, I would say that uh, those are probably the main people. Uh, Tim, of course, and I go back a long way. Yeah, and your yeah. best friends have yep. been for years. We have been for years, yep. and uh, yep. our careers kind of went in different directions, but uh, I think uh, we both had a good time in, uh, in broadcasting. Any local stories, crazy local stories that jump out in your mind of things or people that you dealt with around here at any point? On the way back from supper, I had to bring a, uh, a monitor out to the... Uh, transmitter site to make some final adjustments on the uh, yeah. FM transmitter once I got it going. And uh, and carrying that thing from the car to the building, I dropped into a big hole. And uh, <laughs> Poor my, uh, my, I saved the equipment. And, That's what, yeah. You, yeah the equipment the... was above my head and I was in a deep hole. <laughs> but uh, finally crawled out and... Jeez. Got it into the building, but uh, yeah, we want to. Tom Shine was uh, the sales. I don't know if he was a sales manager. He may have been, but uh, I probably learned an awful lot of production techniques from Tom Shine. Okay, and uh, so he was instrumental in my on-air uh, experience. Uh, and uh, you know you can't forget about Skip Knight, who oh, was uh, the legend. You know the uh, morning man there at True for years and years and years. And when I worked for CBS, of course, uh, uh, cousin Brucey was on FM, and oh, yeah. uh, Dan Ingram was on FM. Wow! wow. And, uh, well, they had great talents. Oh there. yeah, amazing talent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Did and you I ever run into like Letterman or? Uh, Anybody like that at the time? No, I uh, on the TV side ran into uh, Walter Cronkite uh, one day. <laughs> wow! I had to uh, 
<laughs> you know, there was nobody around to record some crap he was doing for uh, uh, TV learning channels that he uh, that he did some work for. I had to find a reel of tape and uh, tape his a uh, uh, few lines that he did for for this TV program. So I did that uh, at uh, CBS AM. We had. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the mayor of New York, uh, Giuliani. Giuliani, yeah. Uh, yeah. He was there uh, every Monday night okay. and uh, did a talk show, and people called in to talk to the mayor. They forget he that he was the 9-11 mayor. Yes, he was. Yeah. And he was the right, right guy. He was guy the right the guy right for time. that time. Yep, sure yeah, was. Sure was, yeah. Yep. And while I was there, uh, let's see, the Yankees... Uh, Won the uh, World Series a couple of times, and uh, uh, Giuliani was mayor and uh, ran uh, ran a real tight ship. And uh, security was, of course, yeah. of the utmost importance even then. And uh, so we got to attend all those meetings, and then uh, we uh, had talent down there at uh, uh, at the plaza where. Uh, uh, the baseball players were going to be interviewed after the ticker tape parade. So uh, it was an interesting experience. Wow, and, uh, wow. you've had such a great career. You've I, had a great career. Yeah, I really have. You've done have. so many I, different things. Yeah, that's true. You've been all over the country and uh, yeah. wow, just, just impressive. Really and impressive. I, uh, uh, I had to go downtown on New Year's Eve. Uh, when was that? That had to have been. It was just to watch the ball come or down. Uh, no, I had to bring some remote equipment down oh. to a, a spot we had set up down there, so our air talent could go down there and okay. provide their input on uh, on New Year's Eve. And uh, that was just wall to wall people. I couldn't believe it. I oh, had yeah. never been in a in an area where there were so many people in so little area. I sure am glad I got out of there before 2001, though, man. Oh, yeah, can you I imagine? I wouldn't have wanted to go through that. No, that's really so, uh, sad. I, uh, I knew a few people at the CBS TV station, and, of course, they were up there at World Trade when it came down, never got out. I just want to say it's always been... Uh, a pleasure to know you, my friend. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, I'm glad I was able to do this.